Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining us today, listeners. I've got a great guest for you. Please help me welcome Kay Adams. She is a licensed clinical social worker and a dementia coach. And we're going to be talking about how to plan our caregiving and make it easy for our loved ones to help care for us if we end up in that boat. So thanks for joining us, Kay. Thank you. Great to be here. So you've had a lot of life experience in hospice and I can't even remember. There's a huge list and that's the one that popped into my head first. So give us your background and then we can talk about what we were just talking about before I hit record. Okay, sure. So yeah, I'm a a licensed clinical social worker first and foremost, but um, I have spent the last 20 some years working with people facing life limiting illnesses, uh, including dementia. So that was in hospice. Uh, and the, my team that I worked on in hospice took care of folks who lived in nursing homes, assisted livings, and memory care. So a disproportionate number of those folks were living with cognitive change and dementia, as well as other illnesses. And then um, you guys have Kaiser out in California. I work for Ki- the Kaiser system here in Colorado. Um, and part of what I did there was work in a diagnostic memory clinic with a team of professionals, interdisciplinary team that um Kaiser members got referred if they were having memory changes or concerns and our team evaluated them and then um, met with the families to explain the diagnosis and all of that. So I was kind of up close and personal there on the opposite end of the dementia, you know, contingency there. And then um, I worked in palliative care also, and I was the home-based dementia specialist. So I was driving all over the city here, doing home visits, um, having conversations with folks living with dementia, if they could participate and their caregivers providing education, helping with advanced directives, helping with understanding what the disease was, the trajectory of it, what kind of systems you need to get in place that, you know, because most people don't understand what's coming. And then I started my, yeah, I started my own business called Compassion Works. Um, Really about in the spring of 2019, was it really going about a year before COVID? That's my now new place marker that I remember (laughs) it by, unfortunately. Um, And so I do two main things. I do dementia coaching. And since COVID, it's all changed. I work with care partners across the country. So they can live anywhere. It could be an individual on Zoom, or it could be a family of eight. And let's talk about what do we do with mom, dad, grandma, husband, wife, whoever it is. Um, And so that's wonderful. And then I do a lot of educational offerings um, on Zoom and in person, both for family care partners and professionals and organizations. Which is a huge need. And I did an episode, oh, Lordy, it was pre-COVID, so it might have been 2019, on palliative care. And previous to that, most people had no clue about palliative care. I learned about it through my, the support group that I was in. Mm -hmm. Um, I think most people know nowadays, I actually facilitate a support group. I have done that for the last year. So can we talk a little bit about what palliative care can do for a family who's caring for somebody with a cognitive impairment? And then we can go to the the planning and all that stuff we talked about before. Sure. So, I mean, most of us are pretty familiar with hospice. I'm I'm beginning to see a shift in um, the culture, maybe is that, I don't know if that's the right phrase, but people are starting to understand that hospice is not just that you wait till the very, very end and call them in for the last month or less. But, you know, I mean, I've, I know many people whose family members are like on their third evaluation of hospice. They've, right. they've been on for, let's see, six, seven, eight, nine, ten months. And mm-hmm. that's not unusual. And it's, and calling in hospice is not giving up on your loved one, but there's a f- frequently a much longer period of time where we need additional help, but we're not, our loved one or whatever is not, they're not ready for hospice. They're not that close to the end. So can you explain, like I said, what, what palliative care is and what it can do for a family with a cognitive impairment illness present? Yeah. Well, the thing (laughs) most people don't know what palliative care is. Um, and, and, um, it is part of a continuum. So, so the word palliate means to relieve suffering. So it's in the so it's in the same family as as uh, as hospice. It's upstream. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. So hospice is in the, is in the quality of life business, right? It's in the, we want to um, create a system for people where they're, we're going to really their suffering physically, emotionally, spiritually, and to support the families, right? That's what hospice does in the last six months or so of life. Palliative care is upstream. So it's working with anybody with any illness. It could be a child, could be anybody with a life limiting illness. So an illness that could lead to their death or an illness that is going to be chronic and serious over time. Okay. And so it, it could be at any point in that where someone can, can get support. Because if you think about it, whether it's cancer or it's lung disease or it's, you know, the terrible things with COVID or something that might, it might have long hauler impact, it's going to affect everything. Right. And so um, palliative care can come in and support uh, individuals or families around these life limiting illnesses. And it, the setup is really different. Um, I'm really used to the Kaiser model and I'm not as good at everything outside of that, but um, we had a pretty robust palliative care program in the Kaiser that I worked in here in Colorado because it was hospital based, it was clinic based and it was home based all three. That is not easy to find a lot of places. Um, and so people could go to the clinic and say, my loved one is diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what to do about that. So they could get some education, they could get support, they could get some counseling around that. But um, it's limited to how much support and stuff you can get. But it it was a resource to plug into that that can can, kind of knows what to watch for. What are the red flags? What are the changes that might be coming upstream to kind of help people point those out? Because what can be happening in front of a care partner's eyes as a symptom, they don't recognize as a symptom. They don't recognize that this is trouble. This is leading to something else. And so they can kind of keep their pulse on that. So it's extra support. Um, I also did a lot of stuff with home-based palliative care because that was my job for a year and a half. Um, The the tricky part is, depending on the system that you work in, is for a lot of home-based palliative care programs, they might have a criteria like you have to be homebound Mm -hmm. in order to qualify, meaning maybe you only go to the church or the grocery store. Everything else is a hardship to go to. So it, you know, so a lot of people that need help, really need help, don't qualify for that because they're still driving or they're still out and about in the community, maybe getting lost a lot, maybe (laughs) struggling, you know, but they're still kind of out there. So, um, but I think palliative care, it's kind of like an entryway, a kind of a gateway into just a a system of support that can kind of oversee things. So I always think if anybody's getting any kind of diagnosis that can be serious to ask their providers, you know, is there palliative care available? What does that look like here? What, what is offered in this system or, you know, with my medical team or providers, because it's going to differ, you know, it's going to differ from place to place, but, um, how it differs from hospice, particularly in the dementia realm. When I started in hospice in the fall of 2001, the Medicare definition under um, to qualify under a dementia was really, really broad, really, really broad. So I had all, I had some people for three consecutive years on my caseload with a primary diagnosis of vascular dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that. So the problem with that is that the hospice system and the and the uh, reimbursement under Medicare is set up for ideally the last six months or less of life not for three years. So it was kind of breaking the bank of Medicare because especially with dementias, uh, they're very unpredictable, right? Unlike some certain kinds of cancers where they're like three to six months or a year on the, on the outside, maybe you have, right. With dementia, Oh, three to 20 years, right. (laughs) You don't know. (laughs) Yeah. And, and so, so what they ended up doing over time was from that really broad, generous, diagnostic category they narrowed it and narrowed it and narrowed it till it's now super super defined and small meaning to to qualify under a dementia diagnosis for hospice which is part of palliative care at the end right right it's, it means that you cannot I, I i don't remember every criteria right now but you certainly can't walk you certainly can't talk you can't make meaningful conversation you can't dress yourself you can't feed yourself um you have to have had maybe, um, you know, documented declines, um, pneumonias, infections, all these things. So basically what it went from is this really broad catch-all diagnosis to a very, we're going to get you in the very last weeks to months of your <laughs> life diagnosis. Um, and that way, 
you know, they were really defining it so it could keep into that hospice benefit period. So the, what was hard for me when I was in palliative care is that a lot of times um, the I wanted to get people on hospice so they didn't quite qualify. And so you almost hope, this sounds bad, but you almost hope they have a secondary diagnosis of a lung disease or heart disease or cancer or something that might qualify them for palliative care or hospice. When the dementia diagnosis, they, you know, they have a long way to go still of a decline before they qualified. Meanwhile, that person needs tons of care, right? And the caregiver yeah. needs tons of support. So, um, so that's a long answer, but I think palliative care is upstream and it can be any illness at all, any life-threatening illness, any age, any stage. Of the and hosp illness. hospice can be any age also. Any age and stage, uh, but it should be the last part. And so in palliative right. care, you might be getting... You might be getting surgery. You might be doing um, chemo, radiation, all the bells and whistles because you're trying to relieve that suffering of the cancer or whatever it might be, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're palliating. You're trying to do that um, and trying to live your life. And this disease is changing your life. And, and everybody around life. you. <laughs> right. And so trying to get support and education around what is this going to do? And to think forward, like, okay, when you have to go through these treatments, you're probably not going to be able to work. or you know, every other week you might be sick for three days or, you know, that kind of stuff. So how do I plan my life? How do I plan my finances? How do I plan my energy? All those kinds of things. How do I talk about this in a death denying culture that doesn't want to talk about illness at all? Yeah. Right? And so have people that are really honest and upfront and empathetic and compassionate and knowledgeable is super important. And that's where palliative care can come in. Because like I said, I learned about that. 2018, 2019, I believe. And I was in the process of researching it for mom. So yeah, this had to be 2019. <clears throat> and into 2020. And there wasn't, it wasn't going, I mean, I, I wasn't as on top of it as I should have been because, you know, I have other things I have to do too. And that's when she started having falls and then she fell in March of 20, you know, March of 2020. And we all know what happened after that. So I skipped over the um, palliative care, which would have been nice. I think I, I wish I could have experienced it as with somebody who was living in a memory care community, just because there was extra help that all of us needed. Mom, the care, the paid caregivers, you know, mom's family. But, you know, that was not what was meant to be. And then I had one question on hospice and like the when you're evaluating somebody with dementia, mm -hmm. I have a caregiver that I know whose mom entered hospice May of 2021. So they've gone through two reevaluation periods. Mom is obviously declining, but because she's getting such excellent care from her daughter, and then the daughter's got the supportive care from hospice, mm -hmm. the decline, she was like going downhill fast, um, mm -hmm. you know, a year ago. So from January 21 to May 21, it was, it was a rapid decline. And now that she's doing much better, the decline is still happening, but it's very slow. It, her experience is what they're looking for is a decline doesn't correlate very well with an actual decline of dementia. So do they, do they have a different evaluation scheme i don't know what the right word evaluate you know do they evaluate criteria. people with them yeah criteria thank you um do they evaluate them differently or is it kind of a little bit more broad and that's why every i guess it's now 90 days they kind of get into this slight panic that yeah mom still needs all this help i need this help but you know she's not rapidly going downhill like she was a year ago yeah well there's there's definite criteria under every illness under the Medicare guidelines. And uh, like I was just saying, for, for dementia, as a primary diagnosis, it is very strict. It is mm -hmm. very end stage. And so what the hospice people look for, it's usually the first 90 days is the first benefit period, then it's 60 days after that, I believe, or at least that's how it is in Colorado. Um, and so and they have to reevaluate and they have to <clears throat> prove a decline. The thing is, if you're just incrementally declining, it could go for three more years. This is the same problem I was just talking about. And so if they have coexisting problems like, oh, they've had five urinary tract infections, two pneumonias, COVID, 
three falls, they kind of try to get as much evidence as they can that this person really is legitimately declining. Because what happens is if the hospice um, says, yeah, you're recertified for another benefit period, another 60 days or 90 days, and it really wasn't legitimate, and Medicare comes in and does a look at that, they deny all payment to that hospice. They don't reimburse them for all those visits and those medications and the equipment and all that stuff. And so they really have to watch their, you know, P's and Q's, if you will, for that kind of stuff. But what's hard is that and it's not uncommon for people to get on hospice and perk up. Yeah. With that's... all the extra care and eyes and the family feels better and stuff. And so one of the hardest things in hospice, it sounds weird, but when we had to graduate people from hospice, there's two ways to graduate celestial graduation to heaven or you graduate because you get better and stabilized and we have to discharge you and that was super hard because oftentimes those discharges were at least six months in and then they're attached to the hospice team and the family and and the the facility likes all the extra help but you just can't legitimately keep them on and so there are some people that they're on and off. I had one person six times. She was on and off oh, hospice six different times over the years I worked there. She had like lung disease and it was, sometimes it would get really bad where she could barely breathe and she's taken to the ER and all that kind of stuff and on all these liters of oxygen and then it would get kind of better and then it would act up again, you know, back like, oh, she's never going to pull through this one. And then she does, right? <laughs> and so, um, but they're always just trying to look for documentation that's going to support keeping that person on if it's legit. It makes sense. And it's not always legit. It's not always, a, you're not always able to do it. You can't pull a rabbit out of the hat because if they're getting better and they're stable or they're not, it's just so incremental. And then it's going to be, no, we got to take a pause on this and we got to discharge them for the time being, knowing that if other things happen, you know, we could get them back on. Would it be standard practice if you have to graduate somebody with dementia off of hospice to maybe help them transition back to palliative care? As I know this particular caregiver, when they were in the uncertain time of, you know, the reevaluation, but they hadn't gotten the answer yet, um, they're in Virginia. And so it was six months, then a reevaluation. Now it's every 90 days. So, you know, every three months she gets to go through this exercise. Mm -hmm. That's one of the questions that was put to her is, can you put your mom on hospice or excuse me, palliative care? Mm -hmm. And she wasn't sure she checked into it. Yes, she could. Um, But mom has been recertified. So that's okay. So that she didn't continue on with that research too much. And one thing I know that she's um, in the process of doing uh, mom's bed bound needs to be fed um, is not on pureed food, but is on very soft, um, softly prepared foods. And she knows just by looking at her mom that her mom is losing weight, but because mom can't stand, um, they can't weigh her. So she actually posted on Instagram, is there a way of weighing somebody that's bed bound? And they do have a Hoyer lift. And she learned that you can get a scale ish thing for the Hoyer lift. And that's what they're going to do because, you know, mom's skin is great. You know, she, sometimes she talks, sometimes she engages. So she, I think she's, you know, from a, a distant view, obviously, I'm not there with them or seeing them regularly. I just get what she shares. But her, I think her mom is like right on the edge between palliative care and hospice. So she didn't think mm-hmm. her mom would be around at this point, especially this time last year, because the first half of 21 was just hospitalizations, falls, this, that, and the other thing. I mean, her mom basically went from her brain knew how to tell her body to walk to forgetting how to walk. And they thought it was one thing or another. And she was determined to rehabilitate her mom back to being able to walk. And that didn't work. And then it, then it became obvious that it wasn't a physical issue. It was Alzheimer's. So it's just, it's just a crazy, crazy journey. <laughs> it is. It's really stressful. But is it a standard problem? It's like I asked this question and then it went off on a tangent. Is it a standard process to help them move back to palliative care? Or is that if more they were on-, on palliative care to begin with? I, I you know. Um, I, I think that that's a, um, a thing that people would try to do. Again, it's like how rich in resources. Palliative care isn't reimbursed like hospice is reimbursed. No. And so that's the problem. It's not existent everywhere. It's, you mm. know, it's more scarce as a resource. And so if they had a, pal- you know, palliative care program, like if it was here, you know, in the Kaiser system and they had been on home base, let's say, 
palliative care and then they got really sick or they got, you know, had a fall and broke their hip or whatever. Maybe they qualified for hospice and maybe six months later they perked up. They were doing better, didn't qualify anymore. Well, that would be the natural transition to see if they now qualify for home based again to have that oversight. Um, but it's really going to depend on the program and the resources available in that whatever that community is, because there are places where it doesn't exist anywhere. Ugh, you can't really terrible. find it. I know or here it's just health... in the hospital, you know, or or, oh, yeah. or a clinic. Well, it might be really hard to get somebody to a clinic or nearly impossible to get somebody to a clinic. So... I wouldn't want to take my mom to a clinic. I know here in California, I'm not familiar with palliative care through Kaiser. Thankfully, I guess. <laughs> my mom didn't have Kaiser. My husband and I do. Um, but the like, for instance, the hospice company that took care of my dad in 2017 in 2019, they were licensed to also provide palliative care. So I, th I think we've expanded the options here uh -huh. in California. Um, I don't know. That would be good. Yeah. Well, we need to do that everywhere else, please. So let's make that happen, Bay Kang. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I didn't realize that it was mostly um, medical system based. Most places or not. Um, I didn't realize it was non-existent. Yikes. But that mm -hmm. kind of leads us right into what we were talking about before we hit record is. You know, you made you made the comment that one of the problems with hospice is it could be three years to twenty years, and my mom was on the twenty year end. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> yay for us. <laughs> um, and most people don't really realize that they don't realize that you know a cognitive impairment affects things like your brain telling your legs how to walk, like with my caregiver friend, or how to eat, which is kind of what happened with my mom at the very very end. So how do we help families who are maybe at the beginning or in the middle of this journey, you know, see what's coming, as you said, upstream, which makes me laugh because it's so wet outside right now. <laughs> it's like every time she says upstream, I look at the water going by. <laughs> With all the flooding. Right. Yeah, it's not, it's not too much flooding. It's just close to flooding. <laughs> yeah. There's a creek behind our house and it's, it's overflowed a little bit, but it's on a golf course. So it's not that big a deal. It's just very, very soggy. So every time you say upstream, I'm looking out the window going, Yep, upstream. <laughs> you know, I can grab my paddle. So, yeah. so it's well with with dementia, not hospice, three to twenty years. It's dementias, right? Right. And so people can can die fairly quickly from them, or they could live a long time. And so, um, in my job as a dementia coach and educator, what I do a lot of is educating <laughs> care partners and families around this disease because I find it's one of those, I've worked with a ton of different diseases over the years as a medical social worker, particularly in hospice, but I've never worked with any that have quite as many myths <laughs> that people operate out of or confusion or just ignorance when they think they know. Um, and so, um, I mean, even if you ask people on the street, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Most people cannot tell you. That's that true. Alzheimer's is a form. They, they can't tell you. And, um, and so, I start with that. I'm like, so I do a class every month that's called More Than Memory, Understanding Brain Change and Dementia from the Inside Out. It's a Zoom class. I have people from across the country attend for 90 minutes. And it's like, okay, let's talk about what is it normal aging? What isn't normal aging? Let's talk about the brain changes that go on. How do those brain changes translate into um, memory changes, functional changes, personality changes, all those kinds of things. And I, because I think, this is my philosophy after all these years is that we don't do anybody any favor by, um, you know, sidestepping this or trying to soften it. Because if you don't, if you only think it's a memory problem, you are not ready. No, God, no, <laughs> you are not ready. And so um, trying to understand that from the big picture, all these things that are going to happen because knowledge is power. And so if you understand, okay, well, well, when you start seeing, you know, these symptoms over here, well, that might be an indication that we're now into the next phase, right? We've now progressed from that early stage, maybe to the moderate or the middle stages of things. And we might need to get more supervision. We might need to get more help in the home. We might, you know, all these kind of things. Um, but if you don't know to even think about those things, you certainly aren't being, pro you know, proactive. It's so, true. Ed so educating and providing support and trying to direct people towards resources to find out, um, you know, what's available in their community is, is really important because I also this is my prejudice, but I don't think we have near the support for people living with dementia as we do with a lot of other illnesses. And just oh, no, that's, that's not a prejudice. That's a fact. That's a fact. And even just Alzheimer's of the 120 or so kinds of dementia we, we know about, 
Alzheimer's is the fifth leading cause of death 65 and older. That's a lot of people just with that one form of dementia that are impacted. I mean, it's if you get older, it's hard to know any, any family that isn't impacted somewhere. That is true. You want to hear a yeah. scarier statistic? What's that? In California, Alzheimer's can be the third leading cause of death. Wow. It, it vacillates between two and four, but it's okay. higher than five or six, okay. which sounds like we're doing math now. <laughs> Yeah. So I just think it's it's really important to under, you know, to get a diagnosis, to get an evaluation, to get information because not they don't all act the same, you know. Vascular dementia doesn't act like Alzheimer's or like Lewy body. In the end, yes, they do. They all pretty much act the same in the end stages. When people are bed bound, they can't talk and they can't eat and they, you know, all the communicate and all that stuff. But before that, it, there's a lot of different things that happen. That is with, true. With people. I my philosophy is it's easier to deal with a lot of this stuff if you understand it, I mean, as much as we can. But if if you shy away from learning about the disease, because, you know, let's face it, there's much nicer things to learn about than, you know, any form of cognitive or any disease that causes a dementia. If you If you kind of shy away from it and then they hit some of these crazy changes, it's just so much harder. But when you are educated, even like I, with my example, my my Virginia friend, she thought she could fix her mom, la, her mom's lack of walking, and now she looks back on it, and thinks, "Man, I was a, I, you know, I was kind of dumb." Well, you're so close to the issue, and they thought it was a blood clot, so you know, I mean, there was reasons to believe that that was true, and she didn't push it, push it, push it for very long because it wasn't working. And she's a highly educated person and and very, very involved, very, very, you know, educated on the disease. And so she was able to transition from I'm gonna I'm gonna help my mom rehabilitate to go so she could walk again to accepting the new reality. Whereas mm -hmm. I think if she hadn't been educated and very understanding of the disease, I think that transition might have been a lot harder and a lot more depressing because you know, it almost seems like something that's happening to you as well as your loved one. So that's that's my pitch for learning all you can. And then even if it doesn't, and I'm sure I probably don't have too many listeners in this boat, but even if you it doesn't affect your family, understanding what's going on with your neighbor or your yes. cousins mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, this is just a growing problem and everybody's going to be dealing with it one way or the other unfortunately sooner rather than later but that's why we're yeah, here <laughs> exactly so what so a bit so people should get educated they probably should continue like i keep learning from guests like yourself and my mom's been gone for almost three years which is that blows my mind and i'm like i said i'm still learning you know because there's new better practices new ways of doing things new understandings so what do you suggest that, you know, people who are at the early stages and the middle stages, where should they go? And what should they be doing? What should they be thinking about? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Well, I think the same goes for those folks if they can get educated about what's going on with them. Because, um, you know, I learned from Tifa Snow that about you know fifty percent of people that get 
diagnosed don't ever have insight. They don't see it. They can't, they can't see the changes in themselves. And the other 50%, at least in the early stages, tend to get really anxious or depressed or overwhelmed or go into hiding, right? Yeah. You know, because they don't, they want to mask it. They don't want to put themselves out there so that people see those changes. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it's really important too. I, I do coaching also with people with um, mild cognitive impairment, early stage dementia, but I have to really screen for that to make sure that they're insightful and they understand what's going on. Or otherwise it's probably not a good use of either of our time um, with that. So they need to get educated too. And this really plays into advanced directives because if they really truly do understand the disease, you know, um, then they can make some really good informed decisions in advance so that whoever has to act on their behalf knows. So one of the things I did for years in Kaiser is go to people's houses or meet them in the clinic and help with advanced directives. And it was all people with either myocognitive impairment or dementia that I was working with and one of their family members, because you always have to have a checks and balances Mm -hmm. because they may not be an accurate historian. Right. (laughs) And so, and you needed somebody to kind of play off. Is this, is this, you know, if your mom is choosing, you know, your oldest brother for her medical proxy, is that consistent with what you think she would do historically? Or have they been estranged for 20 years and now what the hell is she talking, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so, cause that wouldn't make sense. Right. If she right. suddenly was changed her son that she hasn't spoke to in 20 years. Um, but it, it trying to massage those conversations. So, to, you know, down to saying to people, you know, if you got to the point in your illness where you were no longer able to swallow, would you want a feeding tube? That was one of the questions I asked. And then people would be like, what do you mean? Like that could happen to me with dementia. I'm like, yeah, you know, and then they like, how does that happen? So you talk about, you know, how that symptom comes up. They're like, hell no, I don't want, if I'm that gone in that disease, I don't want a feeding tube. Well, our society's sort of set up, like give them all the bells and whistles unless you say otherwise, right? And yep. put it in writing and tell the person who's going to act on your behalf. But most people don't understand, unless they've been around it, what that end stage is going to look like. So, and for me, from all my hospice hat years, you know, the feeding issue is a huge stressor with families. When people don't want to eat from whatever chronic illness it is, you're, they're dying. You're killing them. They're not eating. Well, stopping eating and drinking is a natural part of dying. Right. That's what the body does. <laughs> um, but as loved ones, we just want to open up your mouth and shovel in some more food because we want to keep you here. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so so anyway, I think that applies to it if people can understand the disease early on and make informed decisions. But what happens so often is people aren't diagnosed early. Now, my mom was really good at the denial and the hiding. Now, I don't know if we talked about this before. My grand, my maternal grandmother had vascular dementia. My maternal mm-hmm. great-grandmother had dementia, dementia. She died before I was born. So they called it senile dementia back in those uh-huh. days, I believe. So my mom's issues were not surprising or shot. I mean, it was like, oh, yeah, it was obvious what was going on. And it's interesting because in hindsight... I can see that for a while she was in denial and then it's somewhere and I don't really know where, but somewhere it shifted from her denying what was going on with her to her not knowing yeah. that what that and that's really because it drove me bananas. It's like, you know, if you hadn't denied all this for all these years blah, 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 and then, you know, because of talking to wonderful guests like yourself, I've learned that somewhere along the line, it shifted from literally denying to not knowing it was just crazy <laughs> well and let me say something about that so the to de, to be in denial <laughs> you have to know somewhere in your being that something's going on whatever it is that you're in denial about right mm-hmm. um it's like okay i know this but i'm not dealing with it i'm shoving it away i'm putting it at the back burner i'm not acknowledging it right? i know That's, i need to lose 20 pounds but i'm not going to look in the mirror i'm just going to pretend it doesn't exist and i'm going to go get another cookie right <laughs> yep. okay so <laughs> So that's like denial, but to to deny something, you actually, part of you somewhere deep down inside has to acknowledge, okay? And then you shove it away and then you don't deal with it. But that is different. (laughs) This is where it gets tricky with dementia. And I don't know about your mom, but there are people that the families say to me all the time, I'd be rich if I had a nickel for every time I hear denial. (laughs) But often what it is, sometimes it is denial. They've been diagnosed there in the doctor's office. They came home and bawled about it. They're pissed off about it. They're mad at God or whatever it is, right? So that's denial. They've heard it. They're integrating that. They're freaking out because what this means for their future legitimately, right? Because Mm -hmm. it's a grief thing. It's like, now what do I do, right? Um, 
But that is different than lack of insight. So what happens a lot is people don't have any insight. Everybody else around them sees it as a problem. Everybody else can can point to what these things are, these changes. But literally, that is a cognitive skill that some people never develop, by the way, <laughs> insight, <laughs> you know, and so they, they don't have that cognitive skill to recognize you're right. I am losing my purse every time I turn around on my keys and my phone. I don't know how to work my computer. You know, I've been financially exploited. I, I get lost three blocks from home. Like they don't know that they can't remember it. They don't track it. That is not denial. That mm-hmm. is lack of insight. So people that do start with denial and hiding and want to mask it and want to duck and dodge, that's one thing. And then it can transfer into, I just don't have awareness. But, yeah, and it's interesting because I'm not sure when when that actual transition happened. I think it was a lot earlier than I believed back then. So it is it is very interesting and it helps. I think it helps people to understand that because I know my mom was in denial because she told me basically, I don't want to end up like my mother. And then she stomped out of the room. Um, that was the day she didn't recognize her handwriting on a client order. That was fun client orders that she didn't take any, she didn't write down due dates or what we were supposed to do. It was just random guess. You know? It was fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was prior to 2005. So let's say it's about 2003. I'm not so sure that before in the next year that she didn't shift to not having the cognitive ability to know that things were going on. Sure. But for us, it just seemed like she was in denial for years and years. Excuse me. That's what most families think. Yeah, well, and it's and it goes back to being educated and understanding what's going on. And it's like I said, I can look back now and go, okay, I think the transition happened a lot earlier than I believed before. And most listeners, if they've been around a while, know the story. My mom was going to donate a kidney to my dad in 2008 and was denied because of cognitive impairment. And I thought, ha ha, we finally have a di- diagnosis. And it wasn't till after my dad passed away which was March of 2017, I told mom's general physician, I need to see her diagnosis. I'm the you know the healthcare power of attorney. I need to get up to speed. And that's when I realized that no, she was not diagnosed with cognitive impairment in August of 2008. She was diagnosed in September, October of 2011. Mm. Well, pff, by that point, it was like, huh, yeah, a blind person that didn't know her could have seen that she had a problem. I mean, it was, she was way mid-stage by that point. And she was 69, so she missed the cutoff. If she had been diagnosed early on or earlier, then she would have been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, which is what I tell people she had. But she that wasn't her official diagnosis because they waited so long. <laughs> yeah, I understand. And you know, and I think it's a little bit better now, but who knows? But you were talking about advanced directives and what other things should people be understanding and thinking about you know, before the end stages, a like care I came, team. <laughs> yes, <laughs> getting a care team together, getting, um, I, I have conversations constantly. I work with mostly, um, so adult children mm-hmm. of someone with dementia, or I call them younger spouses. And by that, I mean, anywhere from their sixties to eighties, I don't typically do zoom with 90 year olds in general, <laughs> but I do have some couple 86 year olds I'm working with right now. And I do FaceTime with one. I do Zoom with another, another, and then oh, there's a third one I do in person. Uh, <laughs> and so, um, you know, but they have to have. But people have, need support, right? As they're going through this, and they need to be thinking about how can they get help. Well, for a lot of the older generations, as a stereotype, I don't ask for help. So I was on a coaching call with an 86 year old yesterday, and I've been working with her for two years. And her husband has Alzheimer's. It's kind of He's very high functioning, but it's it's definitely um, I mean, he's still quite independent and everything, but he's very, 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 very forgetful these days, you know, and driving her crazy with the same questions over and over <laughs> and things. And she's an immigrant. They're both immigrants and uh, they've been in this country for a long, long time. But she keeps saying, I can't ask for help. I cannot ask for help. It's not possible that. And I'm like, tell me about that. I need to understand why is that? And she was saying where well, they were from Holland and even just growing up, it was in the culture world, you did, outside the family, you didn't ask anybody for help. It's, you know, and then with her husband, when she got married, they've been married 62 years. 
he had a problem with her asking anybody outside of him for help. It was like, come to me. If you have a problem, come to me. That was sort of their, their marriage. So, and they had a great marriage and they, they were business partners for 30 years. And so that worked out OK. And then they were immigrants where people didn't want to help them. Right. Mm. They had to be self-sufficient. They had to figure it out. They came with, you know, twenty dollars and a baby, you know, on the oh, ship and stuff. And so uh, so they're proud people. We don't ask for help. And I'm over here as the dementia coach saying, you need to ask for help. <laughs> you need to accept help. You need to get a care team. Because um, just a couple months ago, the daughter-in-law, I coordinate through her with these appointments. And she's the one who pays me on behalf of her mother-in-law and stuff. Because they just want her to have the support. And and she called me one day in crisis and said, you know, I'm leaving work because my mother-in-law just called me bawling, saying she doesn't want to do it another day. She wants to die. Oh. And can, is there any, do you have any, I'm not a crisis counselor you know, in my <laughs> job. But I've worked with this family a long time, and I just happened to have one free hour that day. And so we got the three of us got on a Zoom call with the daughter-in-law present with with her mom. And um, and it was all about just fatigue. It was all about overwhelm. It was all about he was getting up at night and wandering around, and then she can't sleep because she's worried about him or whatever. And then she's not letting anybody in. And so... And she probably has a lot of anxiety and depression that she is old school, doesn't want to take meds for. That's really impacting her. Um, and this is like year three, right, of this mm. going on. And she's quite, you know, fairly isolated outside of her son and daughter-in-law who are amazing. But they both have full-time jobs. And, you know, and and so since then, she told me yesterday, uh, the family has hired a guy just once a week, four hours once a week, that takes the husband on outings. So oh, nice. he had only come twice. And I'm like, I was celebrating like, you know, she'd done the biggest feat on earth because for her it was to get him to come in. And then she's like, do you think it would be bad if I could increase that to twice a week? I'm like, no, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, increase go for it. it. To twice. And then I was like, what did you do with your time when he was gone for four hours? And then she feels guilty because she's like, I did nothing. I sat in the living room in the quiet. I read the newspaper. I had a cup of coffee. I did nothing. And I, I, I I'm lazy, huh? She says no. to me. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's your choice. It's your free time. You get to do if you take a nap, do nothing, go to the mall, do some retail therapy, whatever it is you want to do, it's your time. But for her, that was like, that's huge. Like she doesn't even know what to do with that, right? But just the fact that she moved from total isolation to saying, okay, once a week, I'll try this, right? My husband seems to be pretty accepting of him because especially the older generation are really like stoic. Mm -hmm. I don't need help. I'm supposed to do this. I took these vows. And I don't, I tell people all the time from my experience that I have not yet seen anybody be able alone to care for somebody at home with a dementia till the end stage by themselves with nobody else. I haven't seen it unless, you know, maybe in, without hospice, without other things, unless they had a sudden other illness, they fell they broke their hip, they, you know, something else that happened that speeded up those last years of 24 seven care. Um, but aside from that, it's, you know, they have to have somebody because they could never get to the store to the shower or anything. Right. And so, um, you know, I like you have to plan for that. So that's those, those are those really difficult conversations that, are, that you've made promises somewhere. I'll never put you somewhere. Ugh. And then you're like, oh my God, I might have to put you somewhere. Right. Yep. Um, and so it's all these things to be thinking about finances, you know, support teams, um, how to how to access that help, how to take care of yourself, which is thrown around all the time. And I realize that because as a caregiver, that's kind of a joke. But seriously, because we know caregivers often die way before the person with dementia does. And so I'm always like, you know, and most people have their eggs in one basket, meaning they're the ones. They're yep. the main ones doing everything. And so I certainly saw this in COVID with my clients when there was no day programs open, was when there was no PTOT coming in the house. No, it was like the cavalry has disappeared, right? There is nobody coming. And they were having heart attacks. They were going down. They were ending up in the ER. And then suddenly adult protections involved because their loved one can't be left alone and has to be placed somewhere while, while they're in the hospital or, you know, whatever it was. And I'm like, that's what I mean. Like you, if you have all your eggs in one basket, this is what happens. If the, and, and we aren't a society anymore that knows how to ask for help or, and people run away, right? Especially since COVID, we're scared of each other and illness. 
And, um, and people outside don't understand the disease enough to know that this person's overwhelmed. And if I could just drop by with a casserole or offer to hang out for an hour with their loved one so they could get out of the house or something tangible, it could change people's lives pretty significantly, those small little things. But we don't talk about that. We don't educate. If it wasn't I, that I worked in end of life care for so long, I wouldn't know what to do either. But well, I have so a, I have a, a fairly easy way of setting up a care team. And so since you brought it up, um, I will repeat it because one of these days I'm going to try to do this in a one minute video. So I'm going to watch the clock and see if I can do this. So when you get a diagnosis or when you know that somebody has a life limiting disease, a cognitive impairment disease, this is what I've learned. I learned it from another podcaster that you should do is write down all of the duties, all of the responsibilities you have to take care of today. And then expand that to what is it that you have to do every single week, you know, including taking the trash out to the curb on Thursday nights for Friday morning pickup. What is it that you need to do on a monthly basis? How are you paying the bills? Make this list of all your responsibilities. I know it's going to look atrocious. Now you're going to make a second list of everybody you know, close by, family, friends, neighbors, you know, church, friends, whatever. Everybody you know. If you're in a, um, like my husband and I are Rotarians, make the list of everybody you know. Then you make a list next to their name of what you think their specific skill set is. For example, you will not ask me, Jen, to talk to your insurance agent or your banker or any of those people on the phone. I get stressed out just dialing it. Now, my husband was a real estate <laughs> broker. He was in, in banking for 20 years. That man could sit there on hold listening to that god-awful music, and it doesn't make him want to murder people. I want to murder people after 30, 30 seconds, not 30 minutes. I never get that far. Uh -huh. And he actually would deal with people on the phone until they realized that he was not legally allowed to do that. And then we would do it um, speakerphone. So he was always like a support and it was, it was funny because they never really wanted to be on speakerphone with him because that's not how it works, but that's how it worked for us. But I'm very good at cooking, cleaning. You know, I can do a lot, you know, I can entertain. I can do a lot of that stuff. There is a lot of things that people can do if they live out of town. They can set up your online banking. You know, they can maybe monitor the accounts to make sure you're not getting ripped off. There is a zillion things that people can do to help you that are not hands-on caregiving to the person that you love. They are freeing up your time to take care of that. And I stopped watching the clock here. <laughs> and, you know, like a lot of people, they don't want somebody to come in there and help you with a shower. Or you may not be able to find a male caregiver that can take, or, a, you know, a neighbor that can take your husband out and engage with golf or jogging or whatever, you know, entertains him. That might be, that's very difficult these days. But if they can take away a lot of the burdens of everyday chores, you know, have your groceries delivered, have your kids, you know, make a list and get it delivered. And, you know, then you can just put it away. That saves like a couple of hours. Like grocery shopping is just, pff, I hate grocery shopping. <laughs> so well, that's, then there's a couple of good websites too, caring bridge mm -hmm. and then lots of helping hands is the other one. L L O T L O T S A L O T S A helping hands where they have free calendar things that you can put those care teams together, plug in what you need on a monthly basis and people can sign up. That would be for awesome. Those things. Oh. They, they, they can, they can pick what they want to do. So I'm, I, I'm not a great cook, so I'm not signing up for that, <laughs> but I'll go walk your dog. That works. I'll go mow your lawn. Right. And those kinds of things. And so those websites, caringbridge.com or helping hands, lots of helping hands.com free. It's a great resource that you can get your care team identified and then people can sign up for what they want in the time slots that are available in advance. That helps. Um, but, I, but ideally you want to have somebody that kind of can be in charge of that calendar. You, the caregiver has to provide all those details you were saying, all the mm -hmm. lists and stuff, but, but not, they, in a, in a perfect world, they would not be the one in charge of all that. It would be, that's the first thing to hand off to somebody who's kind of techie or whatever. Okay, we got five holes in the calendar for fe for February. Let's take a look at this, you know, <clears throat> somebody else to monitor that because that's not the, another job that the care partner needs. 
That's true. I would be very good at that because I'm super highly organized. The other reason for having these two lists is if Jen comes to you and says, my gosh, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom, Kay. Is there anything I can do to help? You have an answer because you know you are not going to ask me to call your insurance company because I will run screaming into the street and wish you best of luck. But you might say, hey, could you organize this lots of hands website where blah, 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 what we just talked about? I'd be like, yeah, man, I can do that. I'm on the computer all the time. I'm super organized. That'd be easy. And then they're not sucked in. They don't feel like they're getting sucked in and overwhelmed because that's another big fear. So. That exactly. I had not heard of lots of hands. So I'm going to put that in the yeah, show lots notes. Of L-O-T-S, lots, lots of L-O-T-S. Lots of helping hands. Yes. <laughs> the California yep. slang. Lots of. <laughs> yeah. I got it. There you go. So you also have a book and I can only remember the subtitle, which is silly. <laughs> it's called Bedside Witness, Stories <laughs> of Hope, Healing and Humanity. And then they can get that through your website, Amazon, all the places. Yep. They can get it on Amazon. They can get it through my website, which is just my name, kmadams.com. K-A-Y-M-A-D-A-M-S dot com. Which is um, also in really the show notes. Any, yep. And it's really, I hope to really validate the heck out of the lives of care partners in this book. And it's from three chapters of my life, my hospice years, my um, Kaiser years in geriatrics and memory clinic, and then my, all my what I do in my coaching business and how I support people. And the patients and families I've worked with over the years are my biggest teachers and absolutely my biggest teachers. So it's a little bit like chicken soup for the soul or something like that, but there's lessons learned. And I think it's just my biggest goal here, are two of them, one, shine a light into the lives and living rooms of people living with serious illness, especially dementia and their caregivers, so that other people get a sense of what the hell they're going through right? Mm -hmm. Because they don't know if they're next door, what is happening in that house, why their person who's sick with Alzheimer's is not the same as their person who's sick with cancer, right? That is true. And who doesn't know who they are, who their wife is, who their kids are, where the bathroom is of 35 years in the house, right? All those things. And also what I really ultimately hope is that it's going to impassion people to take an action step. I should check on Betty. I should drop by with a casserole. I should call her. I should come bring coffee and actually just sit there and listen to what a day in the life of her life is like, right? Or sign up for something that she might need to task with. Actually do something concrete, not just go, oh yeah, let me know if you need something or I'm praying (laughs) for you or, you know, and then go on your merry way, but actually be available in some way. Because my thinking is the way the aging trends are going, the way that we don't have enough caregivers, we don't have enough everything. Yeah. Yeah. If we don't start building community and being interdependent on each other with these things, it is going to be a, like a complete, it's a disaster now, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, I, I mean, I can't even imagine how difficult it's going to be. Whether you have all the money in the world, you're not going to be able to find people. Yep. We're seeing that already. I mean, it was happening before COVID and now it's really glaringly obvious. And that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the baby boomer trends that we're reading about, Right. Yep. And so if we can learn to help each other build that karma, um, I think the world's going to be a better place. So so please check out Bedside Witness. Definitely. Well, I appreciate this. And I can tell you as as being a volunteer, like this web or this website, this podcast is a passion project. Like I said, I do a lot of stuff with the Alzheimer's Association. You really benefit when you, you know, the people say when you reach out with a helping hand, you actually can pull back more towards yourself. And that is very, very true. And I'm kind of like, that is not generally my philosophy of life. I've actually learned it by doing. So yeah, I like, I like how you said, put that karma out there because you never know, you might, you might need it. And on the putting a care team together, if we didn't learn from COVID that we have no clue what might happen next week, next month, I mean, you could trip over something innocuous in the house just, or over your own feet and fall and break a leg and now you can't physically take care of your spouse right. or your your parent and so yeah we need to we need to we need to plan a whole lot better we need to so, be a little bit more proactive and get our head out of the sand yeah, that's very <laughs> or any other, other place it might be <laughs> yeah <laughs> well we'll stick with sand <laughs> we'll stick with sand well i appreciate this and like i said your website and the lots of hands it's lots of hands.com lots of helping hands, lots of helping hands. I knew there was a word I was missing. We'll be in the show notes so that everybody can check it out. And I thank you very much for coming on with me today. Thanks a lot. Take care. 
Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.